To celebrate black history and accomplishment, the Post and Courier once again presents this series of video interviews featuring 12 dynamic leaders to know in South Carolina. We talk with people from all over the state about their efforts to advance social justice, celebrate black culture and enterprise, address community needs, and create a better world. Our videos will be released monthly on the Post and Courier website through January 2024. To watch and to read our 12 profiles, plus essays on Martin Luther King Jr., go to postandcourier.com slash blackhistory. Join us again this year in learning about some of our state's remarkable change agents. All right, well, I can see the forest for the trees. Ha ha. <laughs> Harry Forrest. Hello, Adam. <laughs> Hi, welcome and thank you for joining us and talking with us today about you and your work and your life. Um, so what is it that you love so much about Charleston? You were born here, you grew up in the area, and you're working here and living here now. And you recently got a new job and refused to leave, even though the job is, you know, base is, you know. So what, what, why do you like Charleston so much? You know, it's, it's interesting because when I graduated from Bishop England and left for college, I was literally like, I'm out of here. <laughs> You won't catch me back here. I'm off to wherever far afield I can get to. Um, but there's, I think, some comfort in being home, mm -hmm. um, in being surrounded by your family and your friends and just the familiar um, that I enjoy. Um, you can't beat the weather. Um, but maybe you enjoy it so much be because you did go off and yeah. have many years away. Yeah, I mean, it gives an appreciation and even now I travel enough that I miss being home when I'm not home. I just got off two weeks on the road um, for some training and like the nicest thing was Saturday, just like in my house, looking off of the balcony at my apartment at, you know, staring off into the, the oak trees and yeah. hanging out with my dogs. Like, yeah. you know, there's, there's still the, this is home base. It doesn't matter where I go, this is home base. And I think, it really is, a lot of it is connection to family and heritage. Um, the most fun that I had when I first moved back was Christmas Eve and a bunch of my cousins came over to hang out for Christmas Eve. And I mean, we stayed up until like some ridiculous hour hanging out like we were kids and we were all like That's in funny. our 30s. But what was really special, and again, having lived away and then come back, the appreciation for having people in proximity I mean, when I lived in D.C., my sister and my nieces are there, but not that extended family. Right, right. And then working in television, particularly in cable news, like, holiday? What's a holiday? Yeah. <laughs> you know? So you lose a yeah. connection to ritual Everything. and tradition. <laughs> exactly. Everything that's real. Everything that's real. <laughs> but you lose a lot of connection to ritual and tradition when you're working that kind of schedule. So it gave me much more of an appreciation for it when I came back. Okay, well, that makes sense. You grew up in the Westchester neighborhood on James Island, deep uh, into James Island. Almost to Folly Beach. Almost to Folly Beach. Yeah. And this was a largely African-American, middle-class neighborhood? Middle-class African-American neighborhood. Um, my father was a builder, so he, he built our house yeah. in Westchester. My, and again, family, my mother's sister, we have one who's catty corner across the street, another one who's around the corner, one of my dad's <laughs> sisters is, you know, yeah. around the corner in the other direction. My dad was a Shriner, so a lot of his Shriner buddies lived in the neighborhood. And, um, you know, again, that sense of community within an African-American middle class community was, I think, very important, informative for us. I guess it kept you grounded. It gave you a, a base and a set of values that yeah, I mean, you know, I tease that I grew up Catholic Baptist because I went to Nativity in Bishop England, so I was, you know, Catholic school five days a week, but attended New Tabernacle Fourth Baptist on Charlotte and Elizabeth um, on Sundays. And, right. you know, my dad was a trustee, my mother was heavily involved, and so we were, you know, every Sunday in <laughs> the same pew every Sunday with my aunts in the same pew <laughs> every Sunday, and yeah. my aunts and my grandmother singing in the choir, and. So yeah, that sense of you know like values and the importance of family and the importance of community and staying connected. Was it that sort of superstructure that you had here? 
Was that almost the reason why you escaped off into TV land? Yeah. And then it's the reason you came back. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Sometimes you just don't know till you go. So the TV thing is interesting because you weren't on a track for TV, right? Your education was leading you elsewhere, and you just tossed it aside and said, to hell with this, I'm going to yeah. D.C. Yeah. To be with my sister and gain entree into the... I don't even know if it was that clear. I was just going to D.C. Let's see what happens. Because <laughs> you were going to be a doctor. I, I was pre-med biology at Clemson, so I was doing all the things. I was doing all the pre-med courses, and I took biology and chem and physics and hated physics, but I suffered through it all. I did the thing. I did a summer program in New Orleans where I was actually studying for the MCATs, and, but I was a radio DJ at Clemson. And that was my, my outlet. And just like, if you don't know, I'm a talker. <laughs> so that's like my natural default is to talk. And so the talk on the radio wasn't so, so bad. It wasn't so yeah. bad. I had fun. And we used to have a great time, just really good energy. And, um, and my sister was, or still is, the executive secretary for uh, one of those large churches in D.C. And so she's how I got the connection to go to the program in New Orleans where I was studying the for med school. She's also the connection that got me to NBC um, through Ed Suber, who was an engineer for WRC, the local affiliate. So it was nice to be able to sort of pick a path and go, let's see, let's see where this goes. And boy, did it go. It went, it went, it went. It, it, went. <laughs> it went big. Yeah. I mean, you were how many years at NBC? <sighs> Jeez. Uh, <laughs> like 17 or it, something? So it's a little no. less than that because I did a couple years at CBS before I right. was just like, I'm right. out of here, I'm done. But right. I mean, I started there right out of college in 95 as Paige. As a Paige, like and fetching coffee, like the whole the the cliche, toll, right? The toll, coffees, making copies, you know, yeah. answering doors and phones. Bumping and, into the anchors in the yeah. hallways and stuff. Yeah, I mean, like all the cool stuff. Um, did you, you know, spill coffee on anybody? I, not that I remember, but it's possible. <laughs> it's all a blur. <laughs> it's all a blur. But I mean, you know, the WRC building on Nebraska Avenue, which I'm not even sure if it's still there, um, but that building has a long history. I mean, Willard Scott was reporting out of that building, doing the weather from that building. Captain Kangaroo started in that building, oh, if I remember correctly, okay. and the Muppets. So we used to tell this story when we gave the tour of the building because the pages also had to give the tour and we would tell the stories to the kids groups that came in about how if you looked really closely, there were still Muppets hiding in the rafters because they didn't want to go to New York. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know the Muppets started in I, D.C. Yeah. So, I had no idea. So it was just a great little story to tell when we were doing the tours. So, and hopefully I got that story right because it's been about 25 years since I told it. But, <laughs> <laughs> but you get the general gist of it. So you started as a page and you ended up as like a senior producer working with major figures. Yeah, so I mean, you know, quick trajectory. I was, uh, you know, a page and then went to the Today Show in the Washington office as a production assistant. Um, and then MSNBC launched, and right. they basically pulled every kid they could find from all of the corners of NBC, and then just enough adults to make sure that the place didn't burn down, <laughs> and, got, and got us up and running on the air. Um, and so I went from a page to a production assistant to a booker, and in TV terms, a booker is the person who's dialing on the phone all day looking for people to talk either in, you know, in a studio you know, on set or by phone whenever there's breaking news. Right. And I mean, like you want to talk about a churn, that's a churn. That's a churn. Because that's basically like you're dialing for dollars all day. Um, you will come in at nine and you're booking for the 12 and then at 12 o'clock you're booking for the three o'clock show and then at three o'clock you're booking for the seven and then at seven you're trying to, if you get to leave, you're trying to find somebody to start the day the and next day. For how day. long did you do that? Because <sighs> that. that would, I'd burn out quickly, I think. Yeah, I, did, I have a knack for the complex, so I think I probably just put up, deal with stuff longer than average. But I did that until the Monica Lewinsky story broke. And then I managed to talk my way into moving from New Jersey back to D.C. to help cover the impeachment trial on the Hill. Yeah. And so then I wasn't dialing for dollars everywhere. I was just dialing for dollars around D.C., yeah. trying to find 
members of Congress who would, you know, would come talk. on the shows. Okay. So, so I did that. Um, that got me back into D.C. And then I worked on a series of shows. I worked on um, a version of Equal Time, this one with Ollie North and Paul Begala. I worked on, very briefly, Watch It with Laura Ingram. I walked, worked on um, a bunch of different shows and then landed at Hardball for a while. And I was on Hardball from... With Chris Matthews. With Chris Matthews from, I want to say, like 2002 to 2005 and did the Hardball College Tours. So that was, we were on the road every week for 30 weeks straight during election season doing these big road shows. Wow. And, and that was And crazy. every time, every new place you had put the whole show put, together. Put basically. the whole thing together, put the whole thing together, right. find 500 people to come sit in an audience, talk to, a, talk to some, you know, politician, break it all down get home on Friday, do laundry, and get back on a plane <laughs> like Sunday or Monday and do it all over again yeah. for 30 weeks. Yeah. So, so that was crazy, but it was fun. Yeah. We had a good time with that. And then I went into the White House unit in 2005. I want to say it was 2005, and I worked as a White House producer from 2005. So where are we timing-wise, 95? 2005 is 10. Right. Um, so I did that. So you're still at NBC. Still at NBC, still in the NBC family. Um, worked as a White House producer during George Bush's last term. Mm -hmm. um, when President Obama was elected in 08, um, I moved over to CBS and worked as their senior producer for Washington for the early show. Got it. Um, and at that, that point, it was like, same. it was not the same in so many ways, in, in so many ways, but it was also just I think a, in a lot of it was just I was exhausted. Yeah. I mean, if you listen to everything I just told you I did in, right. in 12 years, yeah. it was just like, yeah, I don't need to keep gunning like this anymore. Right. I'm good. Yeah. I'm going home. <laughs>
DC's great, but I, I didn't go to DC for a couple of years after that 2012 gig. Is just, that when uh, you joined the board of the YWCA? I joined the board of the Y, I feel like almost as soon as I got back here in 2010. Um, uh, Il Ilanda O'Neill was the person who invited me to... Um, and they were in big transition. I mean, the building, the, they were selling the building. Yeah. They were looking for a new director yeah, at some point. Yeah, that was all... So when I joined in 2011, the Y was on Cumming Street. Yeah. And... Right near Calhoun? Right near Calhoun, right in the middle of the College of Charleston, really at that point and so and it was really a an organization that has a deep history in the community but we were trying to figure out our why like what are we what are we now um, the why is why exactly and so with a lot of transition happening at the why between say 20 13, 14 when Kathleen Matthews retired and um, not Matthews Kathleen Rogers retired and then we were also in the process of trying to decide whether we were going to sell Cumming Street. And in all of that transition, um, and Ida Sproul had stepped down from board chair at that point, and it was like, you'd be great as board chair. And I'm like, oh, but wait, I, <laughs> I just took a new job. <laughs> Teaching and then I'm consulting. Kind of busy. <laughs> yeah. Well, no, I actually, so the teaching and consulting, let me back up, led to me working at the American College of the Building Arts. And so I was at ACBA and doing my board service and trying to get ACBA's capital campaign started to move into the trolley barn. When I on got upper meeting street. on Upper Meeting Street and then got connected to the recruiter for Donnelly and got the Donnelly job at the same time that all this stuff was happening as a board member at the YWCA. Which was itself keeping you very, very busy which because was, of all the transitional stuff. Exactly. Wow. Okay, yeah. so you land at the Donnelly <laughs> Foundation. The, the Gaylord and Dorothy Donnelly Foundation, yes. uh, which is based in Chicago, but uh, has a huge focus in the low country of South Carolina, conservation and the arts. And Museum and Library Collections, which is now broadening narratives, which is more around cultural preservation. And cultural preservation, okay. Um, which you helped get started, that, 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 that program, last thing, right? That last thing was, um, so one of the things that the Donnelly Foundation does um, is that we do strategy review. Usually it's on a three-year. You're not part of the Donnelly Foundation anymore. I know, it's hard. You have to it's talk hard. about it in the past tense. In the tense. past tense, it's hard. Donnelly Foundation does strategy review every three years. And so every three years we're sort of looking at, is the strategy right-sized for the community that we're in, they're in, and the time that it's operating in. Yeah. At the time, when I was still at Donnelly, we realized that the collections strategy, museum and library collections, really felt like it was just sort of disparate parts of interesting stuff, but yeah. it didn't have the connective tissue to really um, say that the foundation was moving something forward. So at the time, we went through a large effort to have the grantees and other people who are practitioners in that space talk about what are the things that really are important in that field that need to be lifted up and need to be financially supported. And at the time, it was really how do you get the important stories of community, at the important stories for underserved communities mm -hmm. particularly told in a way that still values the community and it's not extracted and told by a majority audience. And so we spent three years working with consultants, working with the grantee partners to really define broadening narratives as a way to tell those stories from the perspective of the communities that own the stories, as opposed to the institutions on the outside. Looking in. Right. Wow. Um, so you're, you were seven years at the Donnelly Foundation? Yes. And there was this, which clearly is, was, a, you, it sounds to me like you were very personally invested in that project. Yes. That this was very meaningful to you personally. But you were also invested, I mean, you knew something of the arts, uh, which was a big focus of yours as well, helping to get grants and develop programs and guide people, all kinds of things, which meant you could bring to bear your mentoring consultant talents as well, right? 
the conservation stuff, though, was brand new to you, right? Like, you. <laughs> what is you, that? You found yourself out in the wild. <laughs> Literally. <laughs> <laughs> and didn't know. Yeah. Right. Yeah. No, conservation that was. That must a, have been fun, though. Conservation was a lift. <laughs> it was definitely yeah. a lift. But, but it you was met a, some interesting people. I did. I did. It was a fun lift, though. Um, and I think. Got to ride in a lot of pickup trucks, I bet. Oh, dude. And, like, I have duck hunting gear now. Yeah. I mean, like, like, I never thought I got duck You've been duck hunting. I have been duck hunting. Yes. I have been out in skiffs and, like, you know, waterways. Like, seriously, like, there's a whole other world of, that I didn't even know existed until I started doing that work. And it's interesting because. Land conservation is such a technical term in some ways. Like, if you ask people if they care about the Francis Marion Forest, yeah. If you ask people if they care about making sure that there's enough open space balanced with, you know, building and growth. Right. Yeah. Theoretically, yeah. The, every, who, who's but, against it? Yeah, right. but if you say land conservation, like, getting people to understand what that was was a challenge, or people who aren't in the space, and then also getting people... And how to do it. And how to do like, it. what does that mean? But it's also the people who do it, getting them to stop talking in acronyms <laughs> so that you actually can talk to regular people about why this is important. So I actually think the journalism background came in handy in a lot of ways, but particularly with that, because I knew like a, th enough to be dangerous getting in, but I was curious enough from my journalism background to ask just all ask all the questions, ask all the questions. And I would tell the grantees, and I would go out on these ride arounds, like, I'm gonna ask you a million stupid questions, just bear with me. I mean- They must have loved it though. You know, it was, I, everybody was great. Everybody was amazing. I, I will tell you, um, Raleigh West, who is now the head of the Conservation Bank, when he was the head of Lord Berkeley Conservation Trust and Man, Raleigh's my dude. <laughs> we, are, we have gone through a lot together in that time frame. But the first meeting that I had with him was like a ride around in Berkeley County. And so it's like meeting up with him in his office in Monk's Corner, getting in this big Ford F-150 and driving around, looking at trees <laughs> and stuff. You have to wear boots. <laughs> and you like, I didn't even mud. like wear all the right stuff. <laughs> And he wanted to go take me to go like look at this, you know, track that they were getting ready to preserve. And we were talking about, you know, like the burial ground, like Swamp Fox Francis Mary. And I'm like, I mean, I, I care. <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> so, and he was great because he just explained it all like soup to nuts yeah. of like what he does, why he does it, why it's important, how he came into it. I mean, he grew up, you know, out on the land so it was really like being able to see why it was important to him and how he was pouring that into his work. Was it infectious? Did you find yourself over time caring? Yeah I mean you know what's been really interesting about doing the work with Donnelly or doing any work over time is you start to see where things are interconnecting and I used to tease people all the time that like you know in Charleston you can I can have a conversation and hit at least two of the three program areas and a few other things with just about everybody that you talk to right. because conservation, the land is tied into the arts, the arts is tied into the cultural preservation. It's one big circle. It's so intertwined yeah. here that you can't have one conversation without the other. Yeah. And Especially in this area, exactly. it seems to me. Yeah. yeah. Everybody's just very invested in all of it, really. Yeah. Whether Even if they you don't know, know it, or it. Not. right? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Okay, so that, then, and very recently, you took this job at MDC. What does MDC stand for? So MDC. I don't even think they know. No, well, that <laughs> we John and I were doing. John Simpkins, the president and CEO, and I were doing a training uh, last week or two weeks ago up in uh, Conway. And he said, MDC. You know, it used to stand for Manpower Development Corporation. Um, and it was formed out of a fund to make sure that people in rural communities in North Carolina were getting workforce training to move into the more urban areas. But now MDC is like, it's like IBM and KFC. And he said that, and I was like, yeah, I guess we are. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, what I really appreciate is how he has framed it as 
it's MDC being meaning, dignity, and community. That mm. we are helping to form a South where all people thrive, where people, individuals find meaning, that they have dignity in the work and in the lives that they're living, and that we're building community. That is very a good description, I think. But I, I think of it as a kind of community development organization that works throughout the rural South, especially, but not only. Um, in a, in a variety of different ways, right? Yeah. They do the, every five years or so, there's the State of the South report that they do, that you publish. Yeah, uh, so, you know, the State of the South is, you know, in evolution a little bit. So John became president of MDC right in the middle of COVID. Mm -hmm. um, and as you can imagine, most of the outward facing things were restructured because of COVID. Sure. And State of the South had not been done since COVID. It was COVID. supposed to be done at that point. Well, I mean, it hadn't, it and we, there was not, other things were being worked on. So State of the South had been, um, what's the word I want to say? But it was on pause. Yeah. So State of the South is back, but it's back in a different format. So it's a much more dynamic um, initiative than just putting a 30 page report, report together. together. So now State of the South is a series of conversations in a series of convenings across the South to look at the data, the regional data. So some of that data includes how the population has shifted in the South, how much of that population is coming in from outside of the South mm -hmm. versus Southerners moving to other Southern states. Which happens a lot. Which happens a lot, but you'd be really interesting to, interested to look at the way it shakes out over a 10 year period. Um, looking at the race uh, racial demographics and how those have shifted over the last decade, particularly when you look at um, white populations, black populations, Hispanic populations, and the rapid growth of Hispanic populations across the South. So taking data like that and then putting it in conversation with community members to really talk about, so what does the data tell you? And where are the points where we can agree to collaborate to make improvements in the areas where we may see where we may see a delta. So State of the South is currently a lot of those conversations which will come and culminate in a report sometime this fall. Mm -hmm. um, and then once we have the report, continuing conversations based on what we're hearing. Well, so it's really about all about engagement. Yeah. I mean, you're really reaching out and talking to people and figuring out what it is they need and what they do and how it works or doesn't work as the case may be. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and I'll, you know, I use this analogy in a conversation I was having with someone when I first started MDC and it goes back to Berkeley County. Um, oh, Jim, was it Jim Rozier who was the county, Berkeley yes, County executive? Yes, for a long time. Who, is, who was hilarious. So Raleigh, because that was his board chair, took me to Jim's house to get on a pontoon to go ride down the Cooper River to go look at property that they were. That sounds like Jim Rohde. <laughs> and you go in Jim's house and he is a good Clemson Tiger. He has got every game ever broadcast on a wall. <laughs> 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 I'm a good Clemson Tiger, so I appreciate that, right? So we're on this pontoon and we're talking about life and he looks at me and he says, you know, it is our job to take people from being at a point where they're comfortable but they're not doing well, but they just, they don't want to mess with it because they're too afraid to see what the, what's on the other side of it. So they're comfortable. They're not happy. They're not doing well, but they're comfortable. It's your job to take them through the uncomfortable, through all the messy stuff and help them get out the other side to comfortable, but in a better life. And that really has stuck with me from, from that ride. Cause it's true. I mean, MDC, what we're doing a lot of times is we're holding space and we're giving people permission to be messy mm -hmm. um, and to work through their issues. Not attacking people, but let's attack the issue. We'll give you the tools to do it. We'll help you think about it and contextualize it. And then we'll help you come up with solutions that you can collectively work on in order to make those communities better. Yeah. Wow, fantastic. And you're just beginning this work. Yeah, it's fun though. Yeah, and, and John Simpkins, I mean, is relatively exactly. new as well to the yeah. organization. So it's a whole new era now. Yeah, he calls it a 37-year-old startup. There we go. I like that. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> well, you have your work cut out for you, Carrie Forrest. Adam Parker. 
Uh, good luck. Good luck with everything. That sounds fantastic because there are a few issues facing the South, like, you know, one or two. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> Um, I think we can handle it. Yeah, I'm sure you can. Listen, it's a, a pleasure. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much.